Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Kieran from Presian. Uh, I am the founder of uh, of Presian, as I said, a spin out from Langerock's R and D team. We're based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we've got a team of about thirty currently, spanning hardware, software, AI, and field. Uh, we build artificial intelligence vision systems, and this is a really interesting topic at the moment, as all the AI systems are coming out. So I thought I'd give you a quick rundown on AI vision systems, how they work, what they are, uh, and then how we can apply that into health and safety, which is what we're doing now. Uh, so I'm going to endeavor to compress entire PhDs worth of work into uh, 30, 40 minutes with using no maths at all. So we'll see how we go with this. Right, so the first question is, what on earth is artificial intelligence? Uh, there's not a nice answer, unfortunately. It means different things to different people. You've probably heard terms artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Uh, they all overlap, and I'm not even going to bother uh, trying to detangle those because people have very firm opinions one way or the other. I think at a high level, the artificial intelligence is trying to replicate human intelligence using a machine. And there are lots of sorts of these things happening at the moment, whether you're aware of them or not. The latest hot one is obviously chat GPT, and that's a natural language processing model. So it uses lots of um, uh, input text and it can generate output. Um, but there are lots of other sorts of artificial intelligence that you're probably not aware of, but are already using. So there are things that uh, around process automation. There are things around image analysis, which we'll talk about. Uh, even your dishwasher, for example, is AI, how it controls everything. But what I'm going to talk about here specifically is artificial intelligence vision systems. And an artificial intelligence vision system at a high level allows you to see something, understand what it is, and then do something just like you can with your own eyes and brain, which is slightly terrifying what we can do now or really interesting depending on how you use it. So the first thing you're probably thinking is, what on earth is AI vision and why is this such a big deal? Because my digital camera from the early 2000s could do this already. So there it is. I've shamelessly stolen a picture from somebody. Uh, the digital cameras could indeed detect faces um, in real time in the early 2000s. So what on earth is this and how is this different than what all the stuff is that's going on right now? So what you previously could do is something called a Viola Jones algorithm. And it's reasonably interesting how it actually works. So if you just want to detect a face, you can run this algorithm and it's very, very fast. It's something called a binary degenerate decision tree. So that basically means it starts off with a picture and it runs a test. And if it doesn't pass the test, you reject it. So that's why it's fast. Uh, I amused myself with grabbing a bunch of images uh, that are artificially uh, generated. So this lady does not exist. She is a artificially generated face. What the Viola Jones algorithm is doing is it basically starts off with a box and puts it over, and on average, eyes are darker than, for example, the nose and the cheek. So if it passes that test, it goes on to the next one. And it puts some boxes around it, and as I said, in general, the eyes are darker than the nose. If it passes that test, it passes on to the next one. And it goes through about 6,000 of these, and that's been optimized over many years. And it's a very, very fast way of detecting a face, and it's actually also very reliable. Now, your iPhones and things like that use slightly different technology, but fundamentally, you are looking for a face here. And this has been a problem that has been solved uh, for about the last 20 years. The challenge comes this sort of image. Clearly, those are people, but I can't see their faces. So how do we detect these things? And how do I detect any object that I want to detect? And this has really been the game changer in the last uh, couple of years. And it's based on something called a deep convolutional neural network. And this is the normal picture that people will give you. And they expect that to mean something to you. It barely means anything to me. Uh, and we are an AI company. So what I'm going to attempt to do, and you can tell me how successfully, is explain what an artificial intelligence vision system using deep convolutional neural networks is doing without any maths at all. Right. So step number one, we have an image. And I've stolen this from Wikipedia because it's a really great example of something called an edge detector. So the first step in an AI vision system is you generally make it grayscale, and then you convert that image to its values from zero to 255. 
So zero is black and 255 is white, and therefore an image can be represented between zero and 255. So that is a small subset there uh, of that image, and you can see all the numbers ranging between zero and 255. So that is step one. Step number two. This is where it starts to get slightly more uh, complicated and interesting. We need to identify the features in that image. Now, what are the features? I don't know. Let's start off trying to find the edges. And this is something called a Sobo edge detector. And you can see those two little boxes there in red. Those are called kernels. Now, you can see pluses and minuses. But basically, what that's going to do is when you run that over and do some matrix multiplication, you will then start to get an output. So let's try and do this. Step number one, I'm going to multiply all of those numbers by the kernel. Then I'm going to do these ones, these ones, these ones, and you probably get the idea. And I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom and out pops the same image that we had before, but now it's just highlighted the edges, which is pretty amazing. Um, so these are the mathematical operations that you can do to an image to turn it from the raw image into an edge. Now, you're probably wondering what on earth is the use of that? What are the useful features of any object to detect them? And this is actually a very interesting question. If I ask everybody to describe what is a person, everybody will come up with a list of different things. They're all probably correct, but everybody will be thinking about it in a slightly different way. So what are the unique features of a person or a vehicle or any other object? And how can I use those mathematical techniques to identify them. Now you can see how we could identify the edges. We've already gone through a Sobo edge detector, for example. So that will identify the edge, but clearly there's more to a person than just the edges. So what are the other characteristics? The answer is that we don't know. So let's take lots of these kernels and you can see examples there. You can clearly see some are highlighting edges. Some are highlighting 45 degree angles, some are highlighting colors. Let's just throw all of them at it and let the computer systems work it out. So what we are going to do is we're going to run that process like we just did with the Sobo Edge Detector lots and lots of times, lots of different kernels to identify lots of different features. And I'm going to try and do this with an example. So here is the number seven. Um, what makes a seven a seven? Well, clearly it's got a horizontal bit and it's also got a, uh, a 45 degree line, but it's also got corners, edges, all sorts of things. So let's run this process using a bunch of different kernels on that number seven. Now we are getting into convolutions. So this is the first part of the name, deep convolutional neural network. So this is a convolution. We are running that kernel over there and we are identifying some key features. Now that is still recognizably a seven, but if we have a look at filter four, for example, you can see that it's highlighted more in white, the horizontal bit. So maybe that feature is highlighting horizontal edges. Filter one, for example, looks like it's pulling out the top right corner. So the feature of the seven that it's looking for is that one, it's the top corner. Now that doesn't look particularly exciting at the moment, but let's do it again. So you can now see that it no longer really looks like a seven, but the features that it's identifying are being um, highlighted more brightly. So you can see there, filter zero looks like it's taking the first bit of the horizontal. Filter four looks like it's now uh, focusing in on the horizontal bit and highlighting that. Uh, filter three looks like it's pulling out the corner and so on. Now, at this point, you can't really tell it's the seven, but let's do it again. And every time we do this, for mathematical reasons, it gets slightly smaller you can now see that's completely abstracted away the fact that it's a seven. That is no longer identifiable as a seven. And you can see it's just a series of dots now, but these are the unique features with a different bunch of different kernels of a number seven. This is like the equivalent of me asking a bunch of people in a room to describe what a person is in secret, collecting all the information. Everybody will have a slightly different answer. Right. Going back to the name, deep convolutional neural network, deep simply means that we're doing more than one convolution. So we have here, we've done three, for example. That's the first step of the process. Step four, let's take all of those and run them together. And you can see that we get a grid of light spots and dark spots. This is now where we can plug in the neural network at the end 
and it recognizes that pattern of light spots and dark spots and it will say, oh, that's a number seven. I know that pattern before. So it might be somewhat anticlimactic to discover that an AI vision system is actually converting everything to a series of light spots and dark spots, and it recognizes that pattern. That is, in fact, what your brain is doing, uh, and that's why it's called a neural network. Now, people in the audience here might be wondering, hang on a minute, how does it know what sort of light spots and dark spots correspond to a number seven? This is where training comes in. An AI vision system doesn't know anything when you pull it out of a box. You have to train it on something. You have to tell it, this is the object that I'm looking for. So this is called the training process. And this happens off in the cloud. Uh, and um, it takes a lot of time and computational power. So there are big training data sets. You can see that I've pulled out some with letters and numbers. You can see I've also got one here uh, that identifies planes. So before an AI vision system works, you have to train it on the objects that you look at. And this is where it gets very, very uh, difficult because you have to make sure that you're not actually inadvertently making your system uh, sexist, racist, biased, whatever it is, because you have to have an accurate representation of all the different sorts of people, for example. Similarly with the letters and numbers, it has to represent all different sorts of handwriting so that you can accurately do it. So once an AI model is trained, you can then feed it another image of, for example, a plane, and it will detect that. So these sorts of systems have been around since about the 1960s, but there's not been enough processing power or the big training data sets to actually do something useful with it. The big uh, game changes that's been happening in the last uh, sort of five years are processing power to allow us to do this, big training data sets like you see there with literally millions of images, and also the algorithms to actually do all this uh, processing. So that's a very crash course in what an AI vision system is actually doing in the background based on deep convolutional neural networks. So you train a system, it learns what the unique characteristics of a particular object are. We don't actually know what those characteristics are, but when you feed it in another image of, let's say, a plane, it will recognize those unique characteristics and it will pop out the answer to say that is a plane. Everybody loves a good uh, kitten picture. So there we go. We can use it to detect any object. Just to be clear, you can train on anything that you want. There it is identifying the kittens. Now, you might see a lot of these sorts of pictures around. You can see the AI bounding boxes around the object. So that is the thing that it thinks uh, is the kitten. And you can see it's correctly identified all five of the kittens on the screen there. Uh, bringing you back to a slightly more heavy industry focused application. This is our AI vision system uh, on a construction site. And you probably can't even see the person on the left hand side. But the AI vision systems are alarmingly good at detecting things these days and it can detect it. Uh, our systems can now detect the hands on steering wheels. Uh, so people as they drive past in real time at uh, sort of 80, 100 kilometers an hour. That's how powerful the systems are these days. And there could be lots of objects at once, lots of different objects. It makes no difference to the AI. So anything you can do with your own eyes and brain, we can probably identify and automate that task away. So how can we use this kind of technology to improve AI, uh, improve safety um, in the heavy industries in particular? So some background for people. Uh, these are Australian numbers. They're slightly old now, but uh, the recent numbers are pretty similar. There are around 150 to 200 fatal accidents and around 100,000 serious injuries in the Australian workplace every year. About 65% of those fatal accidents are being hit by a vehicle. It's by far and away number one. And that costs an awful lot of money. We um, were originally part of Langerock's R&D team. And unfortunately, we can count the number of accidents, but we don't know how many times we almost had a serious or a fatal accident that was just by chance didn't result in that uh, incident occurring. And it depends on whose study you believe, there might be a thousand near misses for every actual accident, but the number is significantly higher. And the problem is these are very rarely reported with manual processes. So the goal was how can we use this AI vision technology that is now technically possible to improve this? And if we take a step back, how would we typically approach improving the safety? Um, 
hierarchy of controls, obviously very successful over decades of bringing accident rates down. Uh, but we're dealing with people and people forget they do silly things because they're tired or they can't see or they need to get a job done. So the, the next stage that people look at in terms of intervention are passive devices. And these are things like cameras and 360 degree cameras. Um, they work only if you're paying attention. So if you're not looking at the screen, which you're generally not doing if you're driving a big machine, then they're of no use to you because you have an incident, then suddenly quickly look at the screen and see what's happened, but it doesn't stop you proactively. So you've then got proximity systems. Uh, these are things like radar on the back of your machines, and they'll alert you that something is there, but not what that thing is. And that's problematic on heavy industry sites where there's a lot of objects close to you. That, that is the nature of the work that we do. There are tag-based systems where every object you want to detect has a physical RFID tag. And the machine is actually detecting that tag. And they actually work really well in controlled environments, such as underground mining and logistics, where you've got lots of shelving because you don't actually need line of sight. The challenge with these uh, systems is that they don't actually tell you how often they went off as a health and safety person. So it might flash at the operator uh, every day, just like your car does, but does it send a video or a message or anything to you in head office to tell you what's happened and also give you pictures and videos of what's happened. So that is the game change with AI vision is that we can alert the operator to the risks that they care about, generally people around a machine. We can alert the people around as well to tell them to get out of the way. And we can automate all the reporting, including video and lead safety metrics. So it's important to understand there's sort of two ways you can implement this kind of technology. The first one is on a fixed infrastructure. Now this assumes that you have a guaranteed internet connection and you can stream all of that back to a server. These are generally fine for indoor warehousing operations where you don't have a time constraint. The other uh, application of it is to use it on edge devices. So an edge device is something that does not require any connectivity to work, but when there is a connection, it can send data in and out. And for safety applications on big machines and indeed heavy industry in general, they have to be edge devices because this magical internet connection that never drops out doesn't exist. So if your internet connection dropped out for two seconds while you're watching video on your phone, you probably wouldn't notice because it's buffered. But if it drops out for two seconds, you'll run somebody over. So an edge system is much more complicated because it needs to do all its processing in the middle of nowhere on a machine in 50, 60 degrees um, in an engine bay and be reliable and always work. That is a huge challenge. And that's what our systems are doing. I keep talking about AI vision in our system. So here it is. Uh, th this is actually a system on the back of uh, some various machines. And these are real videos from blindsight systems that provide video before, during, and after every detection. And all of these are near misses that were not staged in any way because some of them get alarmingly close. Uh, so what you're looking at here is the actual video. And I've left the AI bounding boxes on so you can see what the AI vision system is actually looking at. In this case, generally it's people. And to oversimplify the number that you see across the top there is the percentage probability it thinks it's, in this case, the person. And you can see how good they are at tracking. So remember that AI process that I showed you at the start, that's what's happening over and over again uh, very quickly. And you can see a lot of these are in reverse. So this is connected up to the machine so that it only alerts the operator when you're in reverse, for example, and that stops it being annoying because it's not dangerous to be behind a machine when it's in reverse. Uh, sorry, unless the machine is in reverse. The interesting thing about this technology is not that it should be used for laying uh, blame or investigating what people did wrong. It's about understanding what people are doing and why. So you can probably tell where this is based on the train, but I won't tell you who it is. Uh, these folks here, if they tripped over or stepped backwards, they would die. Uh, but this is what they've been doing for the last 20 years. Nobody from health and safety had seen this until the AI vision systems detected it and reported it all automatically. So it's not about laying blame on people. It's about understanding what people actually do at work, why they're doing it, and how we can improve. Uh, I like to use the example of road and rail corridors. They uh, Machines will typically have exclusion zones 
of six, eight, 10 meters, the corridor is not that wide. So they can either follow health and safety or they can do the work. They can't do both at once. So it's really important to understand that. Here's another great one. People saying, I don't need this technology because I have a spotter. Well, there is the spotter with the blue hard hat and somebody just walked behind a machine uh, while he was operating. So that is the power of the AI vision systems. We can alert you to just the objects that you care about. So we can alert the operator and the people around, and we can automate all the data capture for the first time. This is a recent one uh, that I thought I'd just throw in, uh, again, highlighting the things that are happening on a regular basis on site. This is on the back of a bobcat, and you can see what's about to happen uh, with this person here. And I just want to stress the fact that that road there is live traffic. So when they get out of the way, uh, they are leaning into live traffic. I don't mean to pick on these ones. The, this happens every hour of every day on every job site. We simply have never had the ability to capture it automatically before. So as you can probably imagine, all of this is available to you on the cloud. Uh, on the left-hand side there, you can see the mobile version of it, and you can watch all the videos of all the detections rolling in. Uh, it's my colleague Nathan looking very confused as I remoted in to grab a video. But you can see video before, during, and after every detection. And obviously, these things are available on your computer, heat maps, you can drill in, you can watch everything. So this is a real game changer in terms of what you can do with health and safety. And in particular, I just wanted to highlight this one here. Um, typically, we'd be measuring um, health and safety metrics things like accident frequency rate and lost time injury rate. Those are lag indicators, which have big problems with them uh, in that they're not necessarily all reported. Um, and it doesn't tell you how many times it almost happened. So what we've come up with a blind sight index, and that's the number of near misses, which pops out automatically from having an AI vision system divided by the machine danger hours, which again pops out automatically. So that will give you a number and Broadly speaking, the higher the number is, the higher the risk. But it's a lead safety metric because no accident has actually happened yet. And it doesn't rely on any manual reporting. And it focuses on the very high risk scenarios of people in the plant and doesn't, the numbers aren't skewed by things like sprained ankles, which are also recorded as accidents. Now, you can use this number to actually compare across machine types, across a site, across a project, and compare your company with other ones without having to rely on, again, manual and generally paper-based reporting. So all of these numbers now pop out and you can automatically compare. So if you're a busy health and safety uh, professional and you've got systems all over, which one should I look at? You look at the one with the highest blind sight index, figure out what's going right, what's going wrong, uh, and how you can change policies and procedures to improve that. It might be training, it might be changing the way the works are done. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is a lot of safety is based on negatives um, and that needs to change. So we can also identify the positives as well. So the positives are look for a system with the lowest blind sight index because they're doing very well. What are they doing? How can we share those successes? Right, once we have all this data into the cloud, which we have automatically, we can go actually one step further now. If you had a thousand detections, you don't have time to review all of those. So you can just review the critical ones, but that might still be a hundred. So if you only have time to review 10, because you're very busy, which 10 shall it be? And this is some of the latest stuff that we're doing and it's coming out shortly. Um, you can see what's happening here is there is a blind sight system on the back of a vehicle and it's looking at a person who's also looking at another vehicle. Now, we are also ranking the risk. This is a detection, but we're ranking the risk based on a number of factors like how far away the person is, whether they are paying attention, so facing towards the camera or away from it, and also the rate of closure between the vehicle and the person. So you can see as the person is quite close, uh, it's critical. As they move away, it goes to medium, but as they're further away, but also looking at it, it turns into low. So we can automatically filter and do these things for you as well. And if we run that uh, process over the video that I showed you earlier, you can see what that looks like. So we can report this back to you as this is a critical detection that you really need to do something about. Here we go, they're relatively far away. So low, medium, and as it gets closer, that's critical, for example. So that's the power of what we can do with the AI technology at the moment. So 
This is really creating a new standard in safety. So we can now alert the operators, we can alert people around it, and we can automate all the reporting. Um, it should be the bare minimum. We are in 2023, we can do all sorts of clever things. This is what should be happening on sites uh, around the world. But there are some interesting ramifications for this kind of technology that I thought I'd leave you with. Um, if your uh, performance metrics are based on a certain uh, health and safety KPI, like accident frequency rate or similar, this will significantly change the uh, metrics simply because you're not reporting everything that's actually happening on site. So what is the perverse incentive for somebody who they won't get their bonus because now the accident or danger rate looks like it's jumped a factor of 10? Uh, who gets to review the data? What should they do with it? Who gets to say that that is safe or unsafe, for example, now that we have all this data and it's available to you? Uh, a lot of companies, for example, have a near miss that needs to be, uh, any reported near misses need to be investigated and signed off by the CEO. Now that is vaguely uh, plausible for one near miss per month, for example, but it is not plausible if you're having one per hour on every machine on your site. Now that is the reality of uh, your site, but that is not plausible. So how do we change health and safety processes so that these can actually be implemented uh, practically? And then there are obviously business case uh, issues. What, what is the impact on your insurance premiums uh, if you don't have this kind of technology? Uh, so there's a range of different, um, uh, there, there are a range of implications from having this new technology on sites and available to you. Uh, and I'm happy to have a chat with people about um, some of those in some more detail. So that was all I wanted to tell people. So just to recap what we've done is we've taken people through what on earth an AI vision system is and how it works at a very high level. Uh, we've shown you what the risk case is on heavy industry sites, particularly around people and vehicles. And we've shown you how you can use that technology to improve your safety, but more importantly, the understanding of safety. And just briefly, the implications for this new kind of uh, technology are pretty profound for the health and safety uh, sector. So I'll stop talking. Uh, Hopefully there are some questions in there, so we're happy to address those. Um, yes, if I can just remind everyone to please drop questions in the Q&A panel there. I think um, that last slide raised a lot more questions, <laughs> um, Karen. We probably need to have a whole panel on here to um, discuss those implications, but it's, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, topic. So um, just um, while we wait for any questions, I just want to remind everyone with um, IoT and all these sorts of different systems that are emerging that they can talk to software. Um, so if you have a, a system like MIOSH, you can, they can talk to each other. So um, these near misses, for example, um, depending on how severe they are, could be um, fed into the system to um, generate a new record for an incident investigation and a reminder that last week we had a really good webinar on that um, incident, incident investigation techniques from um, Mark Olston. So Kieran, Paul asks, has there been research into how the system works in a tower crane environment? Right, good question. Um, I might actually just quickly go back to the MIOSH. Um, you're, you're exactly right, uh, we can interface with other systems so uh, whatever one defines a critical alert to be, we can use that as a trigger to create um, something in MIOSH uh, or a similar system. And that means you can continue using your existing uh, health and safety processes and software. So that's really good. Uh, so Paul's question, a tower crane environment. Uh, yes, we have uh, systems, albeit um, they're not on the tower crane uh, for a couple of reasons. The tower crane is typically up in the air and it's quite difficult to detect people or, or particular objects because you might be 60 meters up in the air and they're very hard to see. Um, what we've done is we actually put a system on the ground and it's in the drop zone. So it alerts people if you go into a particular drop zone. Uh, the easy rule of thumb is if you can see it with your own uh, eyes and figure out what it is with your own brain, we can probably do it. Um, Blindsight is typically designed to see about 10 meters because it's optimized for machinery. Uh, but it can obviously be a lot further if the um, uh, object is particularly large. So on a tower crane, when you're looking down, uh, it's probably 
a blind sight is not the right solution for that because it's very difficult to see somebody based on just their head. You'd probably want a motion uh, system combined with a AI vision system. But there are certainly people that are starting to work on uh, this kind of technology for tower cranes. So um, anonymous persons ask, given the benefits of these systems, are there any plant manufacturers who offer their new equipment with these already installed or, or are they all aftermarket additions? Uh, right, we are working with lots of OEMs uh, to get this installed on their machines. Currently, it is aftermarket. This kind of technology has only really been around uh, for a couple of years. So the great thing about uh, our approach is that we are using uh, basically dumb web cameras. And that means that they can take the input feed from uh, reversing cameras and things that are already on machines. And that makes it a really good system because uh, you can get be proactively alerted and then you can also look at the uh, feed from the cameras. So we are working with a bunch of OEMs to use their existing cameras, add in some more processing power, put some alerts in the cab um, and then integrate it in with the cloud. So it won't be long before you start seeing that. And indeed, I suspect it'll be mandated on machinery uh, in the next few years, just like reversing cameras have been mandated on cars. Right. So Stephen asks, is the critical um, low live risk assessment level based on the learning functionality of AI? Yeah, there's a couple of ways that we do it. Um, when we set up a blind sight system, you might say, I want to see 10 meters. I want the operator to alert, be alerted within 10 meters. We also have a separate zone, which is called a critical zone. And that's typically two, three meters away. That's your sort of near miss zone. That genuinely was you almost ran somebody over. So those are very clearly um, marked in the data. So you can say, just show me the uh, critical alerts. And those distances can be basically anything you want. Um, it turns out what most people do is say, I want an exclusion zone at eight meters. Uh, but people can't visualize what eight meters really looks like. Uh, and when we install these sorts of systems, it's a really good idea to put out traffic cones and say, that is eight meters. Is that the distance you want to see? And if it is, uh, then we can just tap on that and create the zone and say, if any object goes into that zone, uh, there will be alerts. So that's how we do the distance. It's sort of based on zone. Once it goes up to the cloud, we can also uh, do post-processing to actually determine the distances as well. Okay, so um, Stephen also asked, is it adaptable? But I don't know if you might have just answered that or maybe we need more information. Uh, no, uh, so I can I can sort of speak to that. Um, our system is a retrofit, so it can go on mobile plant or fixed infrastructure. It only taps uh, plant power uh, or an, uh, sorry, and an alert trigger. So that's the, is it in reverse? Is it in hydraulic lock, for example? Because if it's not in reverse, there's no point in alerting to people behind them. So it's adaptable in that it just takes power and alert trigger. You can put the sensors anywhere you want on a machine or on fixed infrastructure. You can pull it off one, you can put it on another one. Um, the wiring, for example, that you do need to be a plant electrician to put that in, but the actual system itself, you could set that up on your desk in about five minutes and be playing with it. So yes, it's very adaptable. Uh, it comes out of the box. You say, I want to detect you know, people, vehicles, cones. Uh, I want the alert to do go flash red uh, and turn some buzzers on. I want it to look at this particular zone and that's all you have to do. So it's really easy to set up. Um, another question, can the system be integrated into the machine to stop prior to critical leads, um, prior to serious injury? Right, the reason I smile is this is a very common question. Um, and I technically, the answer is yes, that's very easy to do. I think it's a bad idea for four reasons. The first one is, are you potentially introducing bigger safety issues? Uh, the second one, which is maybe the first one, is it really annoys the operators to take their control away from them. Um, one of the biggest challenges with new technology, new systems is getting buy-in from people and you take their control away, they get quite upset. The third one is the legal ramifications for doing that. So who is responsible if there was an accident because you'd stopped it? Uh, and the final one is the interesting one. In AI, there is something called a false positive, and that's detecting an object, uh, let's say the chair that I'm sitting on as a person. Now, it's clearly not a person. There is also the flip side of that, which is a false negative, which is not detecting a person that's really there. And the reason why I explain this is imagine you walk through a door and there is uh, on the back of a chair, there is a high-vis jacket. 
Now, blind sight does everything it needs to do in less than 200 milliseconds. So when you walk through that door, it's already made a decision before you've even sort of had the chance to register. Now, do you want that to err on the side of uh, caution and flag it as a person? Because it could be a person just bent over so you don't see their head, or do you want to wait? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. But if you've plumbed it in to shutting a machine down, the AI has to be 100% uh, correct at all times, and it can never be because of this uh, high-vis issue. Uh, so that's why I strongly advocate it is technically easy to do, but think very long and hard about whether it's a good idea. Very interesting. Um, can the system distinguish dummy versus re real person reliably? It depends on who you mean by dummy. Um, you might be referring to me. Uh, the, the critical thing about what AI vision systems are doing is it is looking for the unique attributes. So just to be clear, it doesn't need to see the whole person standing there in a Da Vinci man pose. As I mentioned, I'm going to just wave my hand in front of it. A hand is pretty uniquely human, so it will detect it based on that alone. If I show it a picture of my top here, which is white, that could be a white wall. It could be anything. So it is very, very good at detecting people. Um, it will detect people on signs. It will detect, some people have cutouts of, of people that are on sediment plates in particular. It will detect those as people because they look like people. Um, now it won't detect you know, any random object as a person, but if it looks like a person, it will detect it. So if you mean, will it detect things that look like people that aren't? Yes, on purpose. Uh, if you mean, will it detect any random object as a person? No. Okay, so with the technology still quite young, how often does the system need to be updated, changed on any machines that already have it? Uh, the Blindsight system has over their updates on board, and you're right, we release an AI update roughly every two weeks, and that happens automatically in the background. So you don't need to do anything. You don't need to go out to machine or plug in a memory stick, anything like that. Uh, that will probably slow down over time as the systems um, get better and better. Uh, but Blindsight in particular has covered that off by having over there updates. Um, can AI learning be applied for inspections, for example, using drones for pallet racking inspections in a warehouse? Yes, uh, broadly, anything you can do with your own eyes and brain, you can probably automate away with a AI vision system. Uh, so this application, for example, might not need a real-time um, uh, processing. So you might be able to take a drone footage or any camera footage of it and then send it to a server and then you know, minutes, hours later, it will tell you the answer. And there are quite a few companies doing connected systems that work well with this. Um, if you've got a pen and paper there, I can rattle some of them off. Uh, the smartvid.io, uh, which I think has recently changed its name to New Metrics. Uh, there's one in Australia called Unleashed Live, um, and there are a bunch of similar sorts of ones. Uh, everybody has their own particular focus. So you might be able to find a company who's already trained its AI on detecting pallets, for example, in, in a warehouse, and you should be able to find that solution uh, that works. As I said, your, your question is really, do I need to do it in real time or can I wait? And I'd suggest that one can wait um, and get the result off a server. Um, so Barry says, do you have any solutions for gas detection? So uh, an AI vision system at the risk of stating the obvious needs to be able to see the thing. Um, so if you can see it, we can probably see it. Uh, and there's been some interesting stuff coming out recently around detecting fires based on smoke. So you can have a camera uh, and it's just looking out over the city or out over the bush and it can detect smoke, for example. Uh, so if you mean gas, as in it's turned into a fire, yes, you can certainly detect that. Uh, if you mean gas, um, uh, colourless, odourless, all those sorts of good things, an AI vision system is probably not the way to detect that. Okay, um, so this one's more of a statement, but um, this technology will certainly have an impact on staff employability, replacing humans by AI, for example, spotters or data taken by OHS officers. Yes, uh, it will. This kind of technology will revolutionise heavy industries, both safety, but also productivity, monitoring, security, all sorts of things. Um, as I said, anything you can do with your own eyes and brain can probably be automated away, uh, and there are lots of low-hanging fruit examples that are generally done by graduate engineers uh, that this kind of technology will dramatically improve. It will not replace the health and safety officer. 
it will make them much more uh, productive and that they can now focus on the real risks rather than running around collecting paperwork. Um, and this one too, I think you've already touched on. What are your thoughts around workers heavily relying on this technology rather than practicing situational awareness? So I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, the first one is they currently have reversing cameras and mirrors all over the machine. So in terms of will people get complacent with this technology? I don't think so. It's a similar sort of argument to, well, I put mirrors on my machine, they'll just get complacent as well. Um, the, the reality is a lot of these big machines, no matter how good your situational awareness is, uh, you can't see out of them. Uh, the blinds, if you ever watch the blind spot diagrams for the machines, um, they are enormous. I've seen the latest uh, big American four wheel drives, uh, for example, I think I, I saw that they put 18 children in front of it before you can actually see over the bonnet. There's just physically no way that you can see everything. And people being people, you will momentarily be distracted. You'll be facing the wrong way. All sorts of things can happen. Uh, this is this kind of technology should not replace the hierarchy of controls. There ideally is not people and uh, plant closely interacting. This is a sort of last line of defense uh, to alert the operator and people around and also figure out where it's happening. The other thing is around alert fatigue. So if the operator gets an alert every five seconds, they will just tune that out like they do reversing beepers. Um, my life goal will be to stop reversing beepers because people will tune them out. Uh, and therefore every five years they try and change the noise. Um, a reversing beeper should only go off when somebody's behind it and then people do pay attention. So I actually think it's the other way around. We can stop doing things that mean people get complacent and only have this uh, when it's actually risky, for example. Uh, and you can change the alerts on a daily basis, for example. Um, you could change the colors so that people don't get fatigued to it. Um, with the operators, we are going for useful without being annoying. And we're going for supporting the operators because most of the time it's not their fault. It's somebody around them doing something silly. So it's actually about supporting the operator. And we've actually had some really good feedback uh, around that. So it was a very long rambling answer. Um, I don't know the answer fully. I suspect it'll actually improve things. Uh, but certainly when you start shutting machinery down, people do get complacent because they know that they can walk behind it and the machine will stop. And that is bad behavior. Right. This next question, I think, is a big can of worms. Um, is there potential for such technology in the future to be used in mitigating psychosocial hazards? Yeah, th this kind of technology will be useful for all sorts of things. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, we can automatically detect cracks in concrete. We can improves people's lives by uh, not running people over. We can do all sorts of things. Um, when people start playing with this kind of technology, they come up with all sorts of interesting applications that I've never thought of before. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see where it all goes. Obviously, safety is very easy to understand, which is don't run people over with big yellow things. Uh, but all the other applications for it are very interesting. What are the health and safety or the mental health um, applications or implications for this because whenever there's an accident uh, that operator rightly or wrongly depending on whether it's their fault or not um, they that'll stay with them for decades if not their entire life so yes it will have big implications for that I don't know exactly what they'll be uh, it'd be very interesting to see over the next couple of decades Hey, I think um, this might be the last one. Louise asks, can operators change the critical limit or must it be changed in the office? For example, it's set at eight metres, but the current site work zone makes it not practical for it to be eight metres. So it's a good question. Um, we allow the operators to change the alert that they get, as in lights, vibration, and buzzer. Um, they can't ever turn it off, but they can turn the buzzer and the vibration off because that might be annoying. They can also change the intensity, as in how loud or how bright uh, the alert is. The configuration change is an interesting one. Um, we don't allow the operator to change that. It can be changed at any time remotely, uh, but we don't allow the operator to change that because typically they will turn it off um, because if it gets annoying, they'll just turn it off. But if there genuinely is somebody there. Um, so you can change it at any time. 
uh, but we generally don't recommend that the operators are the ones that change it. it should be done by the health and safety person and you can do it from sitting at your desk uh, via 4g uh, what it's connected to its configuration and all these sorts of things are generally pre-configured uh, in the early days and most companies set on a standard approach to doing this so that everybody knows what the exclusion zones are but yes you can change it at any time if you wanted to okay well um that's all the questions karen that's really super interesting um and all the questions it raises as well so um yeah thanks for joining us um we will send out this recording later and share it on social media and our youtube channel and um and put Kieran's details there if you want to get in contact. So thanks for today, Kieran. That was really good. Good. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for organising that. Um, if anybody has any questions, comments, or would like to have a play with some of the tech, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is there on the slide. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thank you.